Why is this sword so important for Chinese martial arts? Hey guys, this is Scholar Jin. I'm Jian Bing. Today I want to talk about the LK Chen Snow Peak Jian. And first we're going to talk about the history and then we're going to talk about the form and function of this sword. Now, to begin, we'll start with the name. The name, uh, Snow Peak, is just Xuefeng in Chinese, and there's a pretty direct translation here, so there's not too much to say. It's not a very complicated translation or anything. Moving away from the name, I want to talk a little bit about the history of this type of sword and why it's so important for Chinese martial arts nowadays. And this sword is a Mingguo Jian, or a Jian that's from after the fall of the last Chinese dynasty, the Qing dynasty. So in the year 1911, the Qing dynasty fell and there was replaced by what's a nationalist government or the Zhonghua Mingguo. This time period in China could be quite chaotic, but there's also a strong sense of national identity that was emerging among Chinese people. During the late Qing dynasty, you had movements such as the Boxer Rebellion, which I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but uh, basically there were some peasants who rebelled against the Qing dynasty and they were superstitious and they were seen as kind of like violent thugs in a way, and it made Chinese martial arts look bad. So many educated elites in China during the early 20th century saw martial arts as pretty backwards and quite, you know, violent, thuggish practices. But there were also many people who wanted to reinvent Chinese martial arts and make them into a cultural tradition and sport in a way, and uh, also rebrand them as a way to develop character. During this time you have the rise of the Guoshu or the national arts and there were institutes scattered across China that were specifically dedicated to you know reclaiming traditions and things like martial arts and rebranding them and making them part of the national identity. And things like the Jian were a particular focus of certain famous individuals such as Li Jingmin. Li Jingmin was a lot of things. He was kind of a military strongman but he was an avid fan of, you know, swordsmanship with the tian or the straight sword. And he brought in a bunch of, you know, known practitioners and masters of the tian and had them all meet and work together and collaborate and share ideas and practices and things. And a lot of current and modern day martial arts lineages can trace people back to this time period. And particularly when you're talking about the tian, many of them can go back to connections to Li Jinglin. So many of our modern Jian forms and practices are connected to this time period in a way that many people don't always realize. I think one good form of evidence for how the Guoshu Institute and people like Li Jinglin serve as a watershed moment for many modern Chinese martial arts systems is if we look at something like the sword fingers or the Jianzhi. So in Chinese swordsmanship, whenever you're using the straight double-edged sword, the Jian, then your offhand will usually be pointing with your middle and index finger like this. And you will usually keep this at your wrist, though sometimes you'll extend it out and move it in different ways. However, whenever you're using a saber or a single-edged sword, you'll usually have a hand like this, and you usually brace with this and do other things with it. The exact origin of the sword fingers posture is not completely known. I do know that people like Scott Rodell have looked at Ming Dynasty statues of Taoist deities such as Zheng Wu and seeing that this that the statue is holding this posture. The ginger are also something that's used in like Qigong and traditional Chinese medicine, acupressure, that kind of stuff. But what does this have to do with this sword here? It's very difficult to research Jian techniques that predate the Ming Guo, but there is one text that I found which is right at the end of the Qing Dynasty. And in this text, they're actually using a jin, but instead of using sword fingers, they're having an open hand like what you would use with the dao. That being said, there are also, you know, texts that just a few years later, that's written by a famous military man, a different person, uh, Ma Liang, and he includes the jin zhi, or the sword fingers, in his book describing jin fa, or jin techniques. So I suspect that the use of the sword fingers was not completely universal in China before the Guoshu movement. And I think that the Guoshu movement in many ways is responsible for a lot of the commonalities and similarities that we see between different jian systems in Chinese martial arts. Now let's move on and talk about this particular sword from LK Chen. This sword is very typical for like the 1920s and that kind of era of what many of these famous practitioners would be using. And we have these steel fittings with a white ray skin grip and a nice steel blade. 
this shape of hand guard in English is called like an ace of spades because it looks like the spade on playing cards. Uh, now in Chinese, this symbol would be very, very common during the Qing Dynasty, and it would be adapted to like a myriad of different motifs and artistic styles. So it's not one particular type of guard that looks like this. It's just a very common shape that exists across many different motifs. Moving on up to look at the blade, so many Ming and Qing Dian uh, all have diamond cross sections. However, this one gets a little more interesting because we have a fuller that's, you know, a little ways up the blade it starts and it runs to just towards the tip of the blade. And fullers are nice, they reduce weight. It also can affect the sound that the sword makes whenever it, you know, swings through the air and strikes things, which is nice. Jin practitioners during this period were well aware of design elements that existed on European blades because they had extensive contact with the European militaries and involved in training and things like that. So sometimes on Jian during this time period you'll find a ricasso or a blunted section towards the end of the tip of the blade so you can block with the edge. The groove or the fuller on the blade could also be inspired by connections to European military practices at the time, uh, but that's not necessarily true because we do have fullers and grooves existing on thou blades going way back. Now let's move on to talk about handling. So I really like the feel of this sword. Uh, in previously I reviewed the LK10 Tidu Jianjian or the Grand Marshal Jian, and that one it was very maneuverable and I felt like I could rotate the blade around the handle very easily. But what I really notice about this blade whenever I pick it up is the amount of point control that you have, which is good for practicing with the straight sword. And this blade is also a little bit longer than many that would have existed during the Qing Dynasty. So, you know, thrusting is a very good tactic. This grip is also long enough that you could use two hands on it if you like, and that's nice. I know that some martial arts such as Xin Yi Quan like to adopt two-handed grips for their Tian Fa, so that really opens up that option. Now, speaking on the grip, I did mention that this is made of white ray skin, which is stingray skin for those who don't know, <laughs> and it provides a very secure grip. Now, some people have found these grips to be very uncomfortable because it's almost too abrasive and grips your hand too much. It doesn't always feel as smooth and comfortable as like a wooden grip or a wrapped grip, but you have a very good grip and I've used this sword after I've been like running a bunch and stuff like that when I'm really sweaty and I find that having this ray skin really allows you to just not worry about losing your grip. However, I know that many people find these grips to be quite uncomfortable so that's something that you should be aware of going in. Overall, I found that this sword cut really well, and it was also a lot of fun to use because it suited many of the techniques that I've learned very well. And that makes sense because many of the people who were formative in developing Jianfa forms and techniques were also using swords like this. Thank you all for watching. Please subscribe and don't forget to stay sharp.